Okay, so um, anyway, so what I wanted to do, start out with, or focus on today is Burke himself. Last time I introduced classical conservatism, and I spent quite a bit of time on it, and I'm going to do that again today because I think it's such an unusual concept for students that it's hard for them to uh, you know, understand where conservatism started as opposed to, to it now. And I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a gloss, but you can almost say contemporary conservatism is more like classical liberalism, like what we studied in the previous unit, as far as its emphasis on small government and individualism and the sort of the goodness of rational self-interest and all of that. So contemporary conservatism is more like classical liberalism. Uh, and classical conservatism is like something you hardly see in this country uh, anymore. Okay, so it's, it's a different breed of cat, but it, um, but it raises some important issues and concerns about classical liberalism and by consequence about contemporary conservatism. Does that make sense? Okay, so, and then Friday we will uh, get to um, uh, Christian conservatism and we're gonna talk a little bit about neoconservatism too. So we'll eventually end up dealing with uh, more contemporary type of conservatism. But I wanted to spend more time on Edmund Burke and particularly getting into the, the short reading that you had. It has two parts to it. They're both from his book, Reflections on the Revolution in France. So we'll, we'll take a look at what he had to say. I wanted to back up a little bit and just remind people, <coughs> this is in your textbook, but remind people of, of who he was. Um, he was a member of parliament. Uh, he was, I mean, what we would call an intellectual um, by trade almost, because the way that he got to that seat was by impressing people in the aristocratic class who then basically said, Edwin, why don't you run for this seat? It was a pocket borough. Pocket boroughs are areas that are basically in the pocket of, or were, of, of certain people, okay? People who owned the land in that area intended to control the vote, okay? And had influence. And they basically, Burke didn't have to run for this position to become member of parliament because of that, okay? So he was more of an intellectual, I guess you might say, than a politician, and that he didn't have to run for office and do all that. But once he became a member of parliament, he became a pretty vociferous member of parliament. He would make big, long speeches. He was really quite passionate about the, the issues that he was attached to. And uh, we'll talk about a few of them today. Um, but so he also spent time in debate with people over political ideas. He wrote books, he wrote tons and tons and tons of letters. People used to, you know, kind of like the way we can go back and forth on email now, you know, they, they send back and forth these letters. It took a little longer, but it basically served the same purpose. <coughs> At least hopefully you can have a dialogue using email, absolutely. Um, so he wrote this book, Reflections on the Revolution in France, and one person that he was addressing almost in, almost in a letter-like fashion is <coughs> Thomas Paine, one of the American you know, admirers of, of revolution, advocates of the American Revolution, and, and admirer of the French Revolution. Um, but more generally, Reflections on the Revolution in France is a critique not so much just about the French Revolution as it is a, a critique really of revolutionaries and revolutionary thought in his own country and elsewhere, okay? So it's a, I guess, more of a reaction to the revolutionary mindset generally, okay? And so in it we find, as I said, mentioned last time, that reaction is the fact that there was revolutionary ideas in the air at this time, and people were actually saying, maybe England needs to follow France, you know? This is why we get this reaction that comes to be known as conservatism. Okay? If it weren't for that, there would be no need for Burke to make these statements, okay? So what we see first in this excerpt that you have is a real 
angry kind of tirade against a Dr. Richard Price, okay? Dr. Richard Price was a Unitarian minister, okay? Unitarianism meant, uh, you know, Unitarians believed that there was one God, typically it was sort of a first mover God, not a personal God. They didn't, um, in other words, think of the Christian Trinity. And so denial of the idea of three persons, one God, okay? So with Christ in, in the picture, you have a personal <coughs> Christianity in Unitarianism with one God as sort of the maker of the universe, not necessarily, okay? So Unitarianism tended to be more attractive to sort of enlightenment intellectuals of the day who were, you know, questioning all things traditional, but still believe in some sort of creator, okay? Thomas Jefferson uses that type of language in his, in, you know, in the Declaration of Independence, right? The idea of, of the, the maker of the universe comes out there, right? Um, the creator, sort of the mind behind it all, right? Um, who sets things in motion and then doesn't necessarily interact on a personal level with people, okay? So anyway, that's Richard Price. Well, Richard Price was a minister of the Unitarian persuasion, which, uh, as Burke points out through his language, is, was non-conforming. Okay, what he means by non-conforming is that, um, you know, there was an established church in England. The, 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 the legal church of England was the Anglican church, okay? So, Anglicanism, was the established faith, the one supported by the government, actually supported by people's tax dollars. Others could be discouraged or even persecuted um, depending upon the whims of the monarch, okay? So at this point in time, Dr. Richard Price and people like him were allowed to speak okay, and allowed to hold services and so on and so forth, but they were heavily criticized, both you know, for being Unitarians, for not believing like they should, according to the majority in the traditional concept of, of uh, the Trinity, but also because they questioned politically so much. You know, this was where a lot of people would go if they tended to be questioners, right? Questioning tradition, questioning authority, right? So Burke picks Richard Price. There were others he could have cho chosen, but Richard Price is sort of a symbol of what's wrong in his mind, okay? Um, so some of the language that he uses might have confused you, and that's why I want to spend some time on this too. He says um, he preached at the dissenting meeting house of the old Jewry to his club or society, a very extraordinary miscellaneous sermon. The old Jewry was an actual district in, in London um, that was, and I'm not sure at the time whether it still was, but tended to be uh, you know, an area uh, more populated by Jews. So this is why it's called that. And there, I mean, as an aside, um, uh, there's not much evidence of it, there's no evidence of it other than that in the reading that you have, but as an aside, liberals, conservatives, and everybody in between was anti-Semitic pretty much at this time. In other words, it was so normal to do things like equate Judaism with selfishness and things like that, that Thomas Paine did it and Edmund Burke did it. Okay, no difference. So that's just kind of for your information. Um, Okay, so he says, for my part, I looked on that sermon as the public declaration of a man much connected with literary cabalers and intriguing philosophers. Okay. So here's a minister, in other words, that's connected to philosophers and people who, who are cabalers or people who are plotting and scheming. They're creating cabals. Okay. Um, plotting and scheming with each other. With political theologians and theological politicians. Okay. And that's very important language because you find um, that he greatly disagrees with the mixing of politics and religion in this way. Political theologians and theological politicians, we don't need this combination, so he's very critical of that. 
In other words, Richard Price mixes politics with religion. Okay? And when he goes and he gives this speech, he's talking about how Christianity, or, or I should say more generally, religion properly understood should support political liberalism. Okay, does that make sense? If you believe in God, God wants revolution, in other words, right? So this is the kind of message that he's sending. Um, so Burke says, that sermon is in a strain which I believe has not been heard in this kingdom, in any of the pulpits which are tolerated or encouraged in it since the year 1648. Um, he's referring there to the English Revolution, the Civil War that happened in England in the mid-17th century that we mentioned when we talked about Hobbes. Remember how the people at that time, they actually uh, executed Charles I, instituted a parliamentary type of system without a king, and then you had the restoration of Char the Charles II who came back to uh, England after it was safe. Okay, so he's talking about not since the English Civil War, when we, when we had ministers on the revolutionary side, okay, have I heard this type of language? Okay. He said, when a predecessor of Dr. Price, Reverend Hugh Peters, made the vault of the king's own chapel at St. James ring with the honor and privilege of the saints who, with the high praises of God in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hand, were to execute judgment on the heathen and punishments upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. He's very fond of going back and forth between religious sounding language and political language himself in an attempt to demonstrate this, what he thinks of as a poisonous mixture between religion and politics. So that he's referring to a reverend from that time who basically used his <coughs> church as a means of of violence, you know, that reference to the two-edged sword, inciting violence, inciting revolution, okay? Few harangues from the pulpit, except in the days of your League in France, that's the Catholic, the Holy League of Catholic, Catholics in France, or in the days of the Solemn League and Covenant in England, which was a, it was a covenant between the, the Scots and the English, to, that the Scots would support the Presbyterians in England in that previous revolution. Okay. So not since these types of cabals or groupings of zealously religious and political people um, have I seen this and have ever breathed less of a spirit of moderation than this lecture in the old jewelry. So you know, he's sort of tying up Richard Price with the past, with the past in England, and he's basically saying, you know what, this guy sounds a lot like these previous people that brought turmoil and, you know, the killing of a king and revolution and all of that to us before, okay? Um, and then he goes on to say, no sound ought to be heard in the church but the healing voice of Christian charity. The cause of civil liberty and civil governments gains as little as that of religion by this confusing of duties, okay? So there he makes it pretty clear that for him, the duties of the politician and the uh, religious authorities are different. They're just different categories. Okay, so you've got the church over here, and what does the church take care of then? What would Burke say the, the primary responsibility of the church is? Mm -hmm. Said charity. Okay, charity or love, right? Okay, and that has to do with people's souls. Okay, so in other words, we sometimes get confused about what this even means today. But love or charity, whether it's done, you know, either by giving people things or just by being with people was supposed to convey the love of God and therefore be curing, the curing of souls, so to speak, or the saving of souls. And then you have government over here, and what's government's job? 
well, you know, this is one area where he, he agrees with Locke in the letter concerning toleration. It's not about souls. Okay? Now, that's despite the fact that he approves of the establishment. In other words, he doesn't have a problem. Burke does not have a problem. In fact, he rather admires the idea of the Church of England supported by government. Right? But as far as their tasks go, they're very different. The Church should not comment upon what the government does and the government should not tell the church how to, how, how to do its job. Okay. So there's a little bit of a, a potential problem there for a liberal. But, so the government does, does not deal with souls, but deals with things like law enforcement, you know, providing what people need. Right? There's a lot to be done, but it doesn't include this. Okay. So this is, this is one of his criticisms. I mean, maybe it surprises you a bit that revolutionary thought could come through Christianity, but then maybe not. You know, it's, this is where people meet every week, right? This is where people talk about right and wrong. And even in the American Civil Rights Movement, the black churches were the main source of, of the original Civil Rights Movement and continued to be, play a major role. In, in organizing people, okay? So why? Because, that's it. like I said, that's where people get together, that's where they talk, that's where they talk about right and wrong. So in, in a way, it's sort of a natural thing to occur, but yet Burke uh, believes that it, go, it has gone off the rails, in other words, that in, at least in this case, and it's kind of hard to untangle, uh, in classical conservatism, what belongs to a particular case and what's a more general concept. But at least in this case, it has become radical. And so what we have with Dr. Price is somebody who's more of a revolutionary than he is a minister. Okay, that makes sense? Okay, all right. Um, so, then he goes on to deal with some of Price's political thought, which is the, the revolutionary strain of liberalism that we touched on last time, right? The sort of egalitarianism, you know, um, all people in the world ought to be free, to be equal, to have their natural rights, and so on and so forth. Um, he focuses on Price's condemnation of monarchies. Now, the way that Price apparently did this was to say, I'm not going to criticize the King of England because he's the only one, uh, the only king I can think of that is actually approved of by the people. And Price would have been thinking of the glorious revolution of 1688 where we get not an elected monarchy but a parliamentary system and we get this sort of agreement between the monarch that returned, William and Mary, the monarchs that returned, and the people as to, you know, where you would draw the line with their authority, how far they can go. Right? So after 1688, England's monarch, it was not absolute. The monarchs were not absolutely in power. They had to share power with Parliament. So Price can say, you know, our monarchy is okay because, you know, the people have approved. But I look around and I see all these other monarchies of Europe and they're illegitimate because they don't have popular approval, okay? Now, Burke tends to take that as a rhetorical ploy. In other words, to avoid persecution, to avoid being cut off from being able to speak, people like Price say, we're the exception, okay? But everybody else is breaking the rule, okay? And that's a way that he can get his radical message out without being stopped by the monarch. But yet, and this is a very typical way for a conservative to think, of this type anyway, the fact that he says these things, where he says them, in the heart of London, basically calling into question the legitimacy of monarchy, it's a very destabilizing way of thinking. And what's going to happen if these views continue to be heard and they spread? What will happen to our society? 
how will they think of monarchy differently than they do? Will that lead to um, social unrest? You know, maybe eventually a revolution here. So, you know, there's this again. You know, I think I mentioned last time this notion of the law of unintended consequences. You start here, and it, it maybe it sounds kind of harmless, but what what will happen? What will be the case two or three years later? Okay. Um, so. So this is why Burke spends quite a bit of time on, um, on uh, all of this. And he says down at the bottom of the second page, speaking of Price, his, doctrine, his doctrines affect our Constitution in its vital parts. He tells the Revolutionary Society in his political sermon that His Majesty is, quote, almost the only lawful king in Eng England, or only lawful king in the world, sorry, because the only one who owes his crown to the choice of his people, end quote. As to the kings of the world, all of whom except one, this arch pontiff of the rights of men, that's nice, because he's, he's, sort of, he's sort of comparing him to the pope, right? But the political pope, in other words, the arch pontiff of the rights of men with all the plenitude and with more than the boldness of the papal dis deposing power in its meridian fervor of the 12th century, there's some anti-Catholicism there. You know. He's like the Pope in his, in, at the church's most powerful state. Of course, most people in England were not Catholics. And anti-Catholicism was just about as easy as anti-Semitism. Okay. So he's just blasted Price with, you sound like weirdly like a political you know, Pope of some kind puts into one sweeping clause a ban and anathema and proclaims usurpers by circles of longitude and latitude over the whole globe, it behooves them to consider how they admit into their territories these apostolic missionaries. In other words, if you're in a position of authority and power, if you're a king in, in this country, in England as well as any other, you should be very careful about allowing somebody like Price in. Okay? because these ideas are inherently destabilizing. Okay. Um, so freedom of speech, in, in Burke's view, is not something to totally throw out, but on the other hand, uh, there's a limit to it. Okay. Because he seems to be saying the King of England would be wise if he were to suppress this particular movement here, because it, it directly threatens the order of England. Okay. All right, so what we see Burke doing then, and, and again, this is very classical conservative, he validates tradition. In England, the tradition, he says, is not what, Bur or what uh, Price says it is. It's not that the monarch is somehow approved by the people. Um, in England, the monarchy is hereditary, and that's our tradition. We accept it because it's of long standing and we're used to it. And therefore, we should be very, very careful about changing it. Um, okay, And that belies a, a particular way of looking at the world that you can sort of extrapolate from that particular instance, um, the classical conservative view that tradition represents an underlying reason or function that should only be carefully changed. Okay. People might not even know why it is that their country has a hereditary monarchy. And if you look at it on the surface, it doesn't make a whole lot of rational sense. Sometimes in England, if they had monarchs that weren't very bright, they had monarchs that were crazy, you know, some were better than others, so it would seem so easy to, to knock the idea of, of hereditary monarchy down as irrational. But what Burke is saying is there must have been a reason why this was instituted and why it continued for generation after generation after generation. And we may not fully understand that reason. Okay? That's a general way that of thinking of classical conservatism. You may not understand it, but there must be a reason. 
And we need to be very respectful of these traditions. Okay? Not that we can't change them at all, but we, can't, we shouldn't just sort of throw them out. They don't make any sense. Because then what happens if you throw out a traditional practice as irrational, what do you have to do then? Well, you know, you have to come up with another one that makes more sense. And that's where people have problems. <laughs> they think that they know, you know, what will make more sense and what will work, but in practice, it doesn't always work. And that's exactly what happened with the French Revolution. What really great ideas. Yeah, the monarchy didn't make a lot of sense and it was failing at the time to serve the people. But getting rid of it all, they then had to replace it with something that they thought made more sense and it went out of control. Okay. So there's this respect for tradition, not because we understand it completely, but because we, we can see that it grew up over time, it sort of goes along with society, this is the way people think, and therefore it's easy for them to, to accept what they've been doing for centuries, even if it's imperfect. And that leads to stability in society. Um, if we change it, we should change it very slowly is their point of view, okay? All right. So that being said, we do need to know Burke was a member of the Whig Party. Okay. The Tories were the more conservative of the two. Okay, so the Tories were the party that supported, you know, the traditional notion of divine right monarchy that that would have, if they could have, gone back prior to 1688 and recreated absolutism, okay? Um, the Whig party was fairly liberal in the sense that they accepted the revolution of 1688 and they wanted to hang on to this idea of shared power between the parliament and the king, okay? So he was in a party that was somewhat, strangely, progressive, okay? Um, and he admired the Glorious Revolution and the way he deals with it in this book, which you don't have this part, but it's interesting the way he deals with it is he says, the English people made a change while maintaining continuity. So that this revolution wasn't like the French Revolution, okay? Because they changed who the monarch was and therefore made the, the monarchy more amenable, more conforming to their religious points of view, for instance. But they did this without wrecking the concept of monarchy itself. Okay? They didn't even get rid of the notion of heredity, okay, in inheriting uh, the monarchy. They just made a slight deviation, he says, from the order of succession so that James II's uh, child would not be, his son would not become the king, but rather his daughter and her husband, okay? And therefore, it was, he, this is the exact language he uses, a slight deviation. And he says, in this way, um, they, they preserved the tradition of hereditary monarchy. So people didn't have as hard of a time dealing with that and could accept it, okay? And then um, they actually pledged obedience to the monarchy at the same time that they did have the Bill of Rights and other, you know, other agreements in place so the parliament had more power. And in doing so, he, he uses this terminology that they threw a well-wrought veil over, the, over what change they did make to make it as traditional as it possibly could be. This is a better way of doing a revolution in Burke's view because it preserves what people are comfortable with. And what people are comfortable with is what creates order. Okay? A revolution like the French Revolution that throws all that out creates disorder because it creates confusion and aimlessness. And uh, it also creates opportunity for Op for basically opportunists to come in and take advantage, okay? So, now, you know, 
how would somebody like Thomas Paine or Dr. Price view this, this strange treatment of the English Glorious Revolution, do you think? What would their response be to, to all of this business about preserving hereditary monarchy and throwing a veil over the change? Yeah. Well, I think they would think that if there's something inherently wrong with the way that the society is being governed, that you would need to just change it and not change it entirely. Almost, mm -hmm. they aren't necessarily as um, interested in making these small little changes that they go along. But if there's something that's larger that they see as an issue, they want to see it. Right, absolutely. They, they would have thought this was, in fact, Thomas Paine said, to the extent that the English people, you know, made this slight change and then reestablished this obedience to their monarchy, they were simply doing something irrational and slave-like, you know, and they should, and, and basically he ridiculed the idea that they could somehow pledge not only their own allegiance, but all future generations. He says, how can you even do that? You know? And the English monarchy itself uh, allows you know, people to have a certain amount of power after the Glorious Revolution, but it preserves the idea of its, of its special authority in the, you know, the inheritance of it. And this just is irrational. It's not, it's, it's not democratic. Right, right. So, there was a lot of ridicule of this, this particular line of reasoning that Burke put out there as being kind of cowardly, as you know, just not facing facts, wanting to hide um, his basic approval of the revolution behind some you know, traditional veneer, and being maybe even hypocritical. Um, but, you know, I mean, very characteristic of this classical conservative view is that you know, I hate to repeat myself, but you've got to be very careful about change. And so, you know, to, it may seem hypocritical to throw a veil over, to use language to kind of obscure what it is that you're doing, that you did make a change from absolutism to parliamentary, you know, monarchy, but it may seem hypocritical, but it's actually being politically responsible because you're maintaining that continuity so people are not questioning everything and you can still have an orderly society, okay? All right, um, that reminded me, and some of you have taken the intro to political thought class with me, uh, of the notion that Machiavelli puts forward pretty early on in The Prince, that it's easier to maintain a principality of inheritance. In other words, if you had to prefer which type of rule to have, you would, you would want to have a hereditary monarchy, okay? Because Machiavelli says, you know, if you inherit your power in this fashion, even if your father was, even if your father, the king, was kind of bad and abusive, and even if you just simply follow in his footsteps, people will accept that and deal with that, and they will feel strangely comforted by the fact that nothing much has changed because you know, one thing Machiavelli understood that Burke also understands is people fear change. And change of any type makes people afraid, and when people become afraid, they shut down. They're not as productive, okay? They're not, uh, they're not as responsive. <coughs> so, uh, now, of course, Machiavelli spent most of his time on how to deal with a different type of principality, the kind that you just take, and that's because it's so much harder. Once you have gotten rid of the old prince, what does he say? He says, everybody there is going to be, but whether they supported you being there or not, everybody's going to be asking questions about you. They're going to want to know, you know, where do we stand in this whole scheme? What are we going to get out of it? Okay? Where's our power? Okay. Where's our stuff? So, you know, then you have a whole another set of, of issues to deal with, and a lot of Machiavelli's prints is about how to deal with all those people and all of their demands and expectations and how to actually establish power um, 
whereas it would be better if you simply inherited the rule. Okay. All right, so, and kind of underlying all this is a distinction that Burke makes between license and liberty. Okay. Now, Paine would say, well, you know, or any revolutionary of this time would say, well, you know, the monarchy that you admire does not allow liberty. You know, people don't have enough power in that system. Okay? But Burke says there's a difference between liberty and license. He says if you allow an excess of liberty, what you get is the opposite of liberty. When you allow people to be, able to be free to do and say and live any way they want, what you get is a lot of harm as people flail around and basically hurt themselves and other people. Now, you know, looking at that, we, we come from a very individualistic society. We think, well, that's it's almost paternalistic. It is paternalistic. That's what it sounds like. Meaning, meaning it's almost like he's saying, you know, you, you can't make these decisions for yourself. You need some sort of authority to help you decide how to live your life and what to believe and that kind of thing. And yes, he is kind of saying that, okay? Um, because he says the result of allowing people perfect freedom is that they will abuse it um, and they will create disorder. Um, and then the strong will end up ru ruling because whenever there's disorder, what happens is the stronger, but not necessarily the more morally right, end up being in charge. So Burke redefines liberty as not just freedom pure and simple, but ordered liberty or ordered freedom, which is freedom within the context of some authority. Okay? Um, in fact, in another part of the book that you don't have, he, he lists all these things that people have a right to, as I mentioned last night, and among them are a right to guidance, a right to community, a right to be cared for, a right to be nurtured, a right to be educated, okay? Um, all of which sounds kind of communitarian, and it, it kind of is, okay? Um, basically, he's saying, you know, we are, as human beings, we are social creatures, Okay, and so we're not really just atomistic individuals out there deciding things for ourselves. We are influenced by what goes on around us. We do listen to, to other people when trying to decide what we think and what we are going to do. <coughs> and in his view, it's irresponsible to not try to identify opinion leaders of actual worth and merit, if that's the case. Is otherwise, who comes up in his mind? Of course, he's anti-revolutionary. Dr. Richard Price, people like him come up, okay, to tell people what to think. Um, so, because we're social creatures, we need to be nurtured. We should have context, including authority, to guide us. Doesn't mean that we can't think beyond what the authority says, and I think that Edmund Burke did to a certain extent. But, but you can't start out with absolute liberty and probably end up anywhere useful. Yeah. Kind of like, I hope I'm making some sense. When you're raising children, not that adults are children, but when you're raising children, you don't start out telling them the absolute truth about moral matters, like lying. Okay. The absolute truth is that if you're completely consistent in your moral rule not to lie, you can actually harm people. You don't tell a five-year-old that. As they grow and develop, sometimes they figure that out for themselves, or you end up teaching it to them by having a conversation about it. Your moral position becomes more sophisticated the more mature you become. Okay? Um, but imagine if we didn't give children any sort of just absolute guidance at first. Um, what would they end up like? Would it be the Lord of the Flies? You know, that's what, yeah, could happen. Some people think, right? So you start out with quite a bit of restriction, but then hopefully people develop in their own way of thinking.
So what he's saying there is not that he, the, you know, Burke, I mean, of all people, God, Burke was you know, kind of thought outside the box himself and was very critical of power in a lot of cases. He wasn't trying to advocate for no freedom of thought or speech, but he did tend to think that, that the government, society, ought to provide a good structure for people, right? Um, so that's ordered freedom or ordered liberty. Okay. So some of these we've already dealt with. Um, there's a couple I spe specifically wanted to get to, so I'm going to roll through. The natural aristocracy we talked about last time was basically the idea that um, Burke supported the notion of people like himself, not just people who were born into the wealthy class, but people like himself. He was born into what we would call middle class. Um, who, who were capable of understanding leading ought to be able to lead and be supported in doing so. Okay. Um, he also uh, supported this idea of precedent and we just talked about that. So I'm not going to deal with over that. We've talked about that. I did want to get to this because that, this is what your second reading is about. Um, chivalry, I guess, or gendered honor is something that um, Burke extols and is characteristic of classical conservatism, but not contemporary conservatism. And, um, although a sort of sort of weirdly romanticized version of it might be. But um, in this case, he starts off in your reading with uh, the attack on Marie Antoinette. In other words, during the French Revolution, one of the first things that happened was the revolutionaries, many of whom were women who happened to be part participating in this, burst into the uh, palace and basically, um, uh, you know, frightened and treated abusively uh, the monarchs. Okay. And so the language that he uses here, specifically, you know, he doesn't really even deal with the king. It's how they treated the queen. He says, uh, first starts out with how beautiful she was. Okay, that he met her long ago, beautiful. Okay, Marie Antoinette was, she was beautiful, but I'm sure, but she was not particularly attuned to the needs of the people, so that was the problem with her. But um, anyway, he says, little did I dream when she, uh, added titles of veneration to those of enthusiastic, distant, respectful love, that she should ever be obliged to carry the sharp antidote against disgrace concealed in that bosom. Little did I dream that I should have lived to see such disasters fall upon her in a nation of gallant men, in a nation of men of honor and of cavaliers. That's a reference to the fact that the French were, France is the origin of chivalry, okay? Um, I thought 10,000 swords must have leaped from their scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult. But the age of chivalry is gone. That of sophisters, econo economists, and calculators has succeeded. That's a bash against classical liberal ideas, okay? Economists and calculators who think about profit and about their self-interest. Right? And the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. Never more shall we hold that generous loyalty to rank and sex, that proud submission, that dignified obedience, that subordination of the heart, which kept alive, even in servitude itself, the spirit of an exalted freedom. Okay? So it's very effusive language. He's shocked. You know, he expresses um, there's a connection between the way people treated this woman in this particular case and the way people treated women generally in the revolution, at least women of, of rank, um, and freedom or liberty, okay? Interestingly, kept alive even in servitude itself, a spirit of exalted freedom, okay? Now, that's kind of key to understanding why chivalry, chivalry is important to him. Okay? And it may, not, um, it may not have been apparent what the connection is, because normally women, women now think of chivalry as something that's sort of almost oppressive. 
uh, a thing of the past and all of that, and, and to a great extent it is, but um, that is a thing of the past anyway. But um, what underlies it is this notion of the strong protecting the weak, okay? that it tends to reach its, or it reached its fullest expression in this general principle that men don't hurt women, even if women are not good, right? Which would be the case with Marie Antoinette. Just a general rule that men don't hurt women um, is, is like the most palpable expression of this more general principle of the strong should protect the weak. And I know there's you know, modern objections to the idea that women are weak, but there wouldn't have been back then so much. The, the French Revolution starts that questioning, you might say. Um, okay. So the reason why this principle of the strong protecting the weak is important for liberty is because without it, what you get is people just, again, thinking about how they can use their freedom to take advantage of people that are less strong than they are, whether it's economically or because of physical strength or because of intellectual strength, okay? You make the connection. Okay. If you have people taking advantage of their advantages, you again have disorder. You have a, an argument for revolutionary change. So chivalry, because it has to do with gender, put men into the habit of thinking in these terms, which generally made them better citizens in his view, okay? Um, and so, in general, the classical conservative approves of gender roles, you might, they didn't call them that, but anyway, because of this social um, effect, okay? that if men think of themselves as protectors of their family, of you know, protectors of their women, okay, um, and they are capable of forming this type of relationship with women, the idea is that women perform their role of basically having tame male, male aggression. Okay, so his point of view was men are different from women. And men need to have a reason for self-control. And it's the female influence and the need for protection and the standards that women set. So the classical conservative, again, tends to look at women. Alexis de Tocqueville did this um, in Democracy in America when he deals with women. Even in America, he said, women were the moral center of the American society because of the moral expectations that they placed on the men to be good husbands, protectors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Again, this is another case where you know we've kind of dismantled all that because we think it discriminates against women. And it does. It also discriminates against men who have to do all the protecting and stuff like that. Um, much of that is good, you could argue. What we tend to not look at is the consequences, the, the not so good consequences too. And this is what the, cla the classical conservative basically points out: the not so great consequences. You know, less, you know, fewer intact families. Uh, you know, more social disorder, less citizenship, because there's no necessary connection made in the person's mind between the safety of their family, which may not even be on their radar screen, and, you know, what their government is doing. All that stuff, okay? Um, people put blinders on to the, to the consequences of it. So anyway, that's chivalry. And then we, we don't have time, but next time before we move on, I'll get to the little platoons, because we're going to deal with that. All right, sorry, kept you about a minute over.